All right, so hello and welcome. Uh, we're here to talk about reliably distributing compiled modules. Uh, following Glyph is a tough act, so for the sake of courtesy, please hold your snores until the end of the talk. Uh, so who am I? Well, I'm Paul Kerr. Uh, I write software, sometimes I kiteboard, and I enjoy baking things. Uh, I am an inveterate Simpsons quoter, and this is a thing that may be relevant. Uh, I am Reaper Hulk on Twitter. I am Reaper Hulk on Freenode. I am Reaper Hulk on GitHub, and you get the idea. So what do I work on? Uh, as an employee of Rackspace, I do occasionally work on things for my employer, uh, Rackspace Managed Security. I see my, uh, my coworkers laughing. Maybe they don't agree with that statement. Uh, I also work on the Python Cryptographic Authority, uh, the PyCA, uh, on the project's cryptography, PyOpenSSL, PyNACL, Bcrypt, uh, but mostly cryptography. Uh, and then I also wrote, uh, co-wrote Frankiac, uh, which is a separate talk. Uh, so what do we want to do? We want to install some software. Well, uh, Python is simple, and all you need is pip, right? Um, ultimately, all we want is, upon typing pip install your package, uh, we get the software we want without errors and preferably reasonably quickly. In other words, we want compiled or binary modules to act like regular Python and just work. Uh, for the purposes of this talk and inflating my own ego, uh, we'll be using cryptography as a demo of our user experience with compiled modules. But what actually is a compiled module? Well, uh, facetiously, it is any module that uses binary code. Uh, but perhaps more usefully, uh, it's a module that calls code not written in Python. Uh, in some cases, this might actually be code that's simply DL opened, so no compilation is required. Um, but in the majority of cases, it will be some C code that needs to be compiled using GCC or Clang, uh, which in turn calls system libraries or other bundle libraries that are also typically compiled C code. Uh, it doesn't have to be C. In fact, I'm sure Corey is thinking, why not compile it to Rust? Or some of the other people are going, oh, but Go can target the C ABI now. Uh, so you can actually use those as well. Uh, but the C ABI, which is the application binary interface, is generally the lingua franca for FFI, which is foreign function interface. Uh, common ways to write this, the type of compiled modules we're going to care about here today include the C Python C API and CFFI. So, Let's install some software on a Linux VM. Uh, we're going to use Ubuntu 14.04 with the latest pip in a virtual environment because we're up-to-date developers but forgot 16.04 was out. Uh, we're also experienced people and know that we need a compiler probably, so we type the magic incantation needed for that on our platform. Uh, so that would be apt-get install build essential on Ubuntu or Debian derivatives or something like yum install make auto make GCC on uh, RHEL or CentOS. All right, let's install it. Oh, that clearly did not work. Uh, but actually, as you can see from the SNP markers, that's been simplified to actually show the relevant error. The real error looks more like this. Um, well, we're, 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 we're almost there. Um, oh, oh, I can see it says compilation terminated. Uh, uh, okay, there we go. Uh, so, what went wrong? Well, as you saw in the SNPed area, uh, python.h was not there. Uh, Python.h is the primary include header for Python itself. We are experienced people, uh, so we know how to solve this. As you can see, it says so right there. Uh, uh, admittedly, I might not be all that skilled at drawing arrows. Uh, so we'll install the Python development headers, which we naturally know are named Python-dev or Python-devel if you're on a Red Hat derived distribution. And how about now? Well, not quite. Um, but fortunately, we're all ops and C toolchain experts, so uh, this is clearly because we're missing the libffi development headers, and cffi uses libffi to be able to do this. Uh, so a trifle, we know that we can go ahead and install libffi. Um, yeah, so we install our libffi development headers. Uh, this time, mm, still nothing, come on. Uh, well, we've come this far, uh, and I refuse to let a computer beat me. Uh, so let's go find, find the OpenSSL development requirements. So we just go ahead and install those. Oh, wait, <laughs> sorry, wrong operating system. Um, there we go. Or was it that? Or maybe even that? Um, all right, well, either way, let's uh, try and install it one final time. Uh, success, we've actually managed to install it. Uh, so terrific, problem solved. Uh, you all know how to do this now. We can just move on. Uh, 
well, what are the real prerequisites? We, we guessed we'd need a compiler, uh, but what actually is required? Uh, in the abstract, you're gonna need a compiler, which we knew, uh, and, but that's typically but not guaranteed to be something like GCC, Clang, or on Windows, it's gonna be MSVC, or occasionally MinGW. Uh, libraries, if you're gonna link against one. Uh, headers, so the code can know what function signatures are actually available in the library. Um, so let's go through a few things on uh, the, the primary three platforms of OS X, Windows, and Linux. Uh, implicit in the following slides is an assumption that the user has root or admin privileges, by the way. If they do not, then compiling a module, module may become extremely, extremely difficult. All right, so on OS X, xcode-select-install, and this actually works even without administrative privileges. Uh, except maybe your users are on something older than 10.9, and this is not as uncommon as it should be. Uh, then they'll have to download an Xcode tools package from some legacy source, which is usually deep in the bowels of developer.apple.com, um, and you can only find it if you look at the right time in the third full moon. Uh, so, but let's assume for the moment that you've got an actual functioning Xcode. Uh, but now, your software may depend on libraries that are, are outside the OS X default. In an ideal world, your setup.py somehow magically has all the code you need and will actually bootstrap the compile process, but of course that uses distutils and no one understands that, so it probably doesn't do that. Uh, so if you don't have that, then you're going to have to go ahead and install Homebrew or Mac ports as well so, you have a, that, you, so that the uh, user has a package manager to install the additional dependencies they'll need. Uh, in cryptography's case, you'd need to uh, brew install OpenSSL in addition to Xcode select. All right, on Windows. You need to download Visual Studio. Or someone may choose MinGW, as I previously mentioned, and they will make your life very hard. Uh, for Python 2.7, the user will need the Microsoft Visual C++ compiler for Python 2.7. Uh, for Python 3 and 4, you'll use Visual Studio 2010. And for Python 3.5, you'll use Visual Studio 2015. Uh, this fun thing we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, Architecture also matters. There are 32-bit and 64-bit versions of Python available on Windows, which have surprisingly even usage models. Um, and those require compilers of the corresponding architecture. Uh, and of course, just to complicate matters, Visual Studio 2010's free edition does not come with the 64-bit compilers. Uh, and of course, there's no package manager at all. Uh, so users are on their own building libraries from scratch if your package doesn't try to do it for them. Uh, it's an interesting experience attempting to use uh, MSVC to compile libraries that claim to support Windows but have no, uh, no tooling around it. So we've covered what it took to compile on Linux a little bit already in our experiment with installing cryptography. Uh, but to recap, on Linux, each distribution has its own view of what packages provide the basic compiler tools, as well as its own opinion of what packages provide the required headers and libraries. Um, so unless you have someone who happens to just know what the package different, uh, name differentials are or very good documentation, you're likely to end up Googling many things. But once you've done all that, there are still problems. Uh, when compiling modules, the C toolchain will look in standard locations for includes and libraries. If alternate software is installed separately to avoid conflict with system packages, then users may have to pass environment variables like C flags or CPP flags or LD flags to make the compiler and linker look at the correct place. Um, this is actually a specific requirement in the case of cryptography on OS X. Uh, user lib contains an existing libssl libcrypto implementation, uh, but we don't want that because it's terrible. Uh, so we want to link against the homebrew version. Uh, but that resides in something like user local opt OpenSSL lib. Uh, so we have to pass a bunch of extra flags to make this compile this way. Um, on Linux, you may need to uh, also specify uh, linker flags to set the R path so that it uses the right shared library because of the way namespacing and Linux uh, SOs work. Uh, or you might even have to resort to things like uh, LD preload or LD library path interposition. You might have unsupported library versions. Um, the version of the library installed by the OS package manager may be too old or too new, and thus unsupported by the Python module. Uh, the interfaces for any given library evolve over time, and by necessity, the Python bindings need to change with them. Um, if they don't match, then strange compilations errors may occur. 
Uh, this is especially common in OpenSSL security releases where ostensibly they don't change anything, but in reality they change function signatures for no reason. Uh, Windows CRT and compiler restrictions. Uh, remember how I said there were a lot of compilers there you needed for different versions of Python on Windows? Um, this is a simple, albeit onerous, requirement. Um, all the artifacts must have been compiled by the same compiler version. Uh, so the module has to be compiled by the same compiler as Python itself was compiled with, and any libraries that may link against it uh, are also bound by that same restriction. Uh, and finally, people do terrible things to their computers. Uh, any number of crimes against a sane C build environment ha may have been committed in the past on a user's machine. Uh, installers for projects will litter a user's file system with binary detritus and configs that may wreak havoc with your module's expectations. Uh, I remember one time when I, years ago, I installed MySQL on a Mac and it actually installed a DYLD library path uh, into the bash profile automatically. It didn't tell you it was doing it. Um, and these are the sort of things that work fine in, in isolation but can cause trouble with your build environments. So obviously this is not reasonable. Uh, this is an unfortunately common experience for developers and end users, uh, and they, it, it just is not acceptable. Uh, binary modules are currently causing a significant bifurcation of the user experience. On the one hand, you have the good packages. Those are the pure Python ones, where installation just works. Uh, and on the other hand, you have the transcendentally awful binary packages that no one wants to add dependencies on because who knows what might break and who knows what reports they're going to get because Oh, you added this thing that, that doesn't work on my machine. Uh, shockingly enough, uh, despite what we just showed on, uh, on the original Linux demo, uh, other platforms, especially Windows, can be far more challenging to actually get things working. So wouldn't it be nice if we could distribute pre-compiled software like the operating system package managers do? Uh, then the users wouldn't have to know all of this just to use some software, and the maintainers of said software wouldn't in be inundated with issues that follow this sort of format, or to use the apparently 130 times better search engine. <laughs> so of course the answer is wheels. Uh, with wheels, it can work as if there's no C magic inside. But of course, like any purported panacea, there are a few significant caveats that we'll talk about a bit later. So wheels are the modern Python package format. Uh, they are defined in quite a few PEPs. Uh, you are certainly welcome to read them. Uh, PEP 513 is actually among the most interesting ones because it defines the many Linux one format we'll be talking about a little bit later. Uh, they provide a way to distribute Python artifacts, both binary and non-binary, of course. Um, they are superior in a variety of ways to eggs and sdists, although sdists still have their place. Um, you will never get rid of them, and that's okay. Uh, they can install packages with binary dependencies sans root. Um, for example, if you need to be able to uh, install, imagine a world where you need to install some, uh, a libsodium package, uh, but you don't have root. Uh, it would be nice if you didn't have to get some authorization to sudo apt get install libsodium dash dev, and instead you just typed pip install inside of your virtual environment and got what you needed. Um, of course, pip can produ both produce and install them, uh, the pip wheel command, which is of course uh, in conjunction with the wheel package itself. Uh, and wheels use tags to denote what a given wheel is compatible with. Um, you can see that long message that cr the, the cryptography wheel is, which is basically the name of the package, the version, the version of Python, the SOABI of the Python, which we'll talk about a bit later, the Mac OS X SDK version, and then the architecture. So we have now reached the part of the talk where I theoretically actually impart useful information instead of esoterica that you can blindly forget immediately. So the question's for your project if you want to build wheels. What platforms do you care about? In general, for building binary wheels, you should at minimum care about OS X and Windows. Uh, they are the most popular non-Linux platforms and PyPI supports uploading wheels for both. Um, many Linux One now means that you can poten also potentially supply binary wheels for Linux users, but there are some caveats that we'll get into. What versions of Python do you care about? Do you care about Python 2.6? Do you care about Python 3, but less than 3.3? Please don't care about either of those, but maybe you do. Uh, what about PyPy? The answer to this, combined with the platform question, gives you almost the number of wheels you'll need to build. Uh, more Pythons means more wheels. 
and significantly more infrastructure complexity if you're supporting Windows due to the multiple MSVC requirement. Uh, for reference, cryptography currently uploads 21 wheels to PyPI, uh, but our requirements are somewhat extreme. Can you rely on the library you need to be present on all platforms? In some cases, that answer will actually be yes, and then all you have is basically the glue code that talks, like the uh, DL opens the library or links against it. Uh, but if not, and the answer is probably no, uh, you'll need to make some decisions on how you want to ship it. Uh, if you want an identical experience across all platforms, then you will need to bundle your library with all the additional maintenance burden of that, that that implies. You may also have unusual dependencies, like optionally binding to system libraries for only specific OS releases, and that may affect the way you have to build your wheels. So what's required? Well, obviously, you're going to need an OS X machine. Uh, any recent release will, obviously, will do, uh, but you should really be on El Capitan. There's no excuse not to be. It doesn't cost any money. Uh, Assuming you don't have an OS X version specific dependencies, you can build wheels that work for pretty much any user on 10.6 or, or above. Um, since you're going to want to automate this, it's not a great idea for this to be your laptop. Uh, instead, consider using a hosted machine from something like Mac Stadium or Mac Mini Colo or things like that. Um, you can set them up with ESXi and then you can put Mac, uh, Mac VMs on it. That's actually legitimate. That's actually legal. So those are all good ways to do that stuff. Um, there are, of course, challenges, right? There's, this is not a panacea. It has problems. Um, there are OS X SDK versions. There are universal wheels. And there are UCS2 versus UCS4 ABI issues. So to handle OS X SDK issues, make sure you build against python.org pythons, not PyEnv and not system Python. Um, why python.org pythons? Python.org releases are linked against the 10.6 SDK. Um, this is a little bit less relevant than it used to be, uh, but you can't install an OS X wheel with an SDK tag newer than the OS that you're currently running. Uh, by using python.org pythons, you can neatly sidestep this issue. Unless you want to link against OS X features added in 10.7+, um, like Common Crypto, which is a system crypto service we use in cryptography, which kind of is the callback to why we have 21 current wheels. Um, for universal wheels, uh, Universal is Apple's shorthand for binaries or libraries containing multiple architectures. Um, on OS X, technically, a universal library can contain PowerPC, PowerPC64, x86, and x86-64 code. Uh, but given that the uh, x86 transition for OS X is now a decade in the past, we're going to sweep that PowerPC stuff under the rug and move on. Uh, to create a universal wheel, uh, you need both a universal Python and universal libraries. Uh, universal wheels will work with uh, universal pythons, as well as x86-64 only pythons, and x86 only pythons, if you can find any like that. Fortunately, python.org python releases are already built universally, uh, so they handle both the SDK and the universal question quite neatly. But if you're linking against another library, uh, you will need those libraries to also be universal. You can check that with a uh, aptly named command, lipo. Uh, so lipo-info and path to lib will give you the information about what architectures are present in a given binary or library. Uh, many homebrew libraries already ship as universal libraries, uh, but sometimes you do have to do it yourself. Uh, in that case, there are a pile of flags to pass, and it may not actually work inside of homebrew, so you may have to build it yourself, and that's probably getting a bit out of the scope of this talk. Um, you can, however, check Cryptography's docs, which is at cryptography.io, in the doing a release section, and you can see the way we rebuild OpenSSL to make sure that we have uh, a universal uh, binary for our, for our purposes. Uh, finally, we have UCS2 and UCS4. Uh, so if you've seen symbol not found pi unicode UCS2 as ASCII string, uh, you have already stubbed your toe on this problem. Um, it's only recently started cropping up in OS X. The reason it came about is that Python has two ways to compile use, uh, Unicode support in 2.x, and in less than 3.3, but we don't care about those releases, remember? Uh, so UCS2, which is sometimes known as narrow Unicode, and UCS4, sometimes known as wide Unicode, are two different ways to compile things. Uh, but the resulting Python has a different ABI, which means we need different wheels. However, pip and wheel did not have a tag for this behavior until very recently. pip 8.1 was the very first one that had it. Um, on the OS X side, the system Python is built as UCS2, Python.org is built as UCS2, 
homebrew Python is built as UCS2, and they made an explicit decision to do so back in 2014. Uh, but PyEnv recently uh, just switched recently. Uh, the reason they did this is because their uh, PyEnv is actually used on more than just OS 10. Uh, so with, when, with the advent of many Linux one wheels, um, UCS4 is the common way it's compiled on Linux. So they wanted to be able to share wheels with PyEnv on Linux and also system Pythons on Linux. Uh, but it, uh, so that's an issue that they solve on their end, but actually adds an additional permutation on the OS 10 side. Um, so we need to care about that configuration as well. Uh, and the way we handle that is we go ahead and have one PyEnv uh, in Python 2.7 that you use to handle this case. So to recap, uh, what's required to cover OS 10 users is Pythons from python.org, one PyEnv Python 2.7, and the patience to understand all these permutations. On Windows, uh, you should make your life simple by building a separate VM for 32-bit versus 64-bit Python. Uh, you can try installing them all in one system, but tools like Tox have expectations of where they're going to find Python, and it will make your life much, much easier to just let them have their way. Uh, we've already kind of gone through the way the compilers work for this, but uh, effectively, you'll need to install all these different compilers, uh, and unfortunately, you're going to need to find the non-free version of Visual Studio 2010 if you want to be able to do the 64-bit version. Um, it's not all that hard to talk to Microsoft and get uh, MSDN things for open source purposes, so that's one avenue you can choose. Um, I am certainly not advocating that you BitTorrent it. Um, Many Linux One. It's brand new. It allows you to ship binary wheels for Linux. It's great. Uh, the team behind Many Linux One has done the hard work of constructing the build environment for you. So you can run the command you see right there um, without slash path to Python code, obviously. Uh, and then run pip wheel inside of that uh, to, against the variety of Pythons that live in that Docker image to generate your set of wheels. Um, they even have an audit wheel package uh, that will uh, check the resulting wheels to see if they comply with many Linux One's restrictions about which libraries are actually considered to be part of many Linux One. And the ones that aren't, it will automatically copy them in and then fix the R path up to automatically load those libraries for you properly. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, and of course, github.com, PyPA, many Linux has many examples of exactly how to use it. Um, that's a talk all to itself, so unfortunately I couldn't go in too much depth there. Finally, you need to uh, have some automation. Uh, I mentioned earlier that automation was a thing you'd probably desire, but without automation, as you can see, this process is complex, finicky, and will result in errors. It, it just will. Uh, rather than doing it by hand, you should have something that is kicked off during your release process uh, to automatically build them. In cryptography, we use a Jenkins job that is triggered by an invoke command during our release process. Uh, the job builds and archives the wheels, and then the invoke task automatically downloads them and uploads them via Twine to PyPI. Uh, as part of that, we also actually import the wheels after generating them in a separate virtual environment to make sure they actually work, um, because we have had an instance in the past where we managed to build wheels that didn't actually work and put them on PyPI, uh, and it turns out you don't want to do that. Uh, so I can't stress this enough. Uh, automate this or you will make mistakes. All right, so I promised you caveats, and here they are. Users need the right versions of PIP. Uh, since the wheel tags that have, have only been recently finalized for many Linux One and the wide, narrow Unicode ABIs, many users do not yet have the necessary versions. Uh, based on the PyPI logs, you can search on uh, uh, Google BigQuery, which you should all do. It's really cool. Uh, we can say that OS 10 PIP tends to be far more up to date, while Linux users are more likely to stick with their distributions PIP. Um, this, and then anecdotally, we have seen a reasonable amount of uh, success shipping modern wheel tags to our OS 10 users in cryptography um, while we're still thinking about what we want to do on the many Linux one side. So as I said previously, if the library you're using isn't guaranteed available, you're going to have to bundle it. Um, this bundling can be accomplished by either static linking or copying the dynamic library, but now you, the wheel builder, are on the hook for updating your package every time your upstream dependency changes. And your users are on the hook for knowing they need to update as well. Um, for example, on OS OpenSSL, this is an unpleasant issue. As users of a hypothetical many Linux one wheel that links against libssl may not realize that when they upgraded their distributions package to close whatever CVE that was like, uh, discovered in OpenSSL, it didn't update what their Python code was actually using. Um, it may be possible to somewhat avoid this issue in the future if more Linux binary wheel tag types appear. There's been some discussion about one like an Ubuntu 16.04 or a RHEL 7 that allows you to say, well, 
the library will be provided by the underlying operating system. Uh, but it will still be a problem on OS X and Windows. And of course on Linux for anything that's not uh, packaged by the OS in general. Uh, unusual architectures are not supported by wheels on PyPI. Uh, so your MIPS router and your open power systems will still have to compile it themselves. Uh, so even with all these wheels, you're still going to have users that need to run through the full build process. Uh, so for the love of God, make sure it stays as good as it can be. Um, it will also make your life easier in building your own wheels. There's also a download size and memory footprint increase potential risk. Uh, in large systems with many dependencies, an ecosystem where this sort of behavior is common may result in an increased memory footprint as well as a download size. Um, it's unclear if this is going to be a significant issue outside of truly gigantic edifices like SciPy, but it is one to be aware of as we move into this brave new world. So, good luck, go forth and build your wheels. If there are any questions, uh, stand up or raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. I think I missed something. What is Mini Linux again? Uh, so Mini Linux 1 is a new tag that's, uh, sorry, my apologies, I should have actually given a little more uh, clarity on that. Uh, Mini Linux 1 is a new tag that's been added to the wheel standard that allows you to build uh, binary wheels that work across many different versions of Linux. Um, the way it actually works under the hood is kind of, unpleasant, but what, it, the, what that Docker image is, is actually a, a RHEL 5 version. And there's a set of acceptable libraries that everyone knows will be on pretty much every Linux. Uh, and so you can link against those dynamically and know that because the ABIs have been stable in the last several years, that they will work going forward. So for example, basically they're linking against a really old glibc and knowing that the new glibc will work the same way. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a clever way to do it, but it, it has some interesting uh, trade-offs. In the scientific field, Conda is used a lot. Did you have a look at Conda? And maybe is there some way to, to work together with the Conda people? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite catch that. Uh, Conda. Conda is an installer that's used a lot in the scientific field. Yep. And it's just a question, did you have a look at Conda, how it works? Because it works pretty well, according to my experience. And maybe there's some way to use some uh, Conda's open source also. So you could reuse some of this what's in Conda for these purposes. Yeah, so the way Conda currently does binary dependencies is uh, kind of a, a hybrid of an OS packaging scheme and also the way Python uh, wants to do it. Uh, it there have been some, there's some, some discussions that the PyPA folks and others have had with that, but I've honestly not been involved in it, so I don't know a whole lot. Um, I can say that from the perspective of the cryptography project, um, Conda has caused us some trouble because they do some of those terrible things I was just talking about to the C tool chain. Uh, where they have expectations of being able to rewrite the path, but then the C, uh, like the linker, will try and go and get a symbol that it shouldn't have gotten. Um, so we've had some tr issues on that front. Um, it's not their fault by any means, it's just an imperfect world. Um, so hopefully we can get better in the future by working with them and figuring out how to kind of merge these concepts. Hey, Jake. Hey, Paul, thanks for the talk. That was really, really good and really detailed. Um, so as you said at the end, the uh, this is super complex and there's a lot of moving pieces and you talked a bit about automation. And I'm wondering if you think that that's something that, you know, could, that is possible to sort of centralize, you know, imagine a build service that would take your Python and give you a bunch of wheels or is that build process like differently finicky for different types of libraries? Would you need a different automation for cryptography as for Something, something, something. Uh, so I think actually there's, there's a good chance that this sort of thing can be centralized. Uh, actually, the cryptography Jenkins cluster is used for quite a few things these days because <laughs> uh, we built an infrastructure and it turns out we're willing to let other, uh, a certain subset of other people we know well use it. Uh, I would love to see more of that get centralized. Uh, obviously, not everyone has the resources to run multiple Windows VMs, multiple OS 10 boxes, um, who knows how many other uh, Linux machines eventually if we want to start testing whether or not our many Linux One wheels work across a set of distros. Um, I know Donald Stuffed, uh, one of the main guys behind uh, PyPI, has, has a dream that he'd like a build server that would be able to do this sort of thing. Um, I don't believe we've really moved particularly far forward on it yet, but hopefully at some point in the future this will become more possible. There's obviously the one uh, core issue which is that uh, you're running arbitrary, untrusted code on a build server. Uh, so it's, it's a little tricky to decide who, who gets to do that. Uh, I just want to say first, thank you for the talk. That was really uh, educational. Um, one thing that you didn't mention too much is 
building Python packages that depend on the binary interfaces of other Python packages that have C extensions. Uh, I was wondering if you have any thoughts or advice on that. Uh, as far as I know, there's no good way to build wheels on that or for those packages because they can't, you can't know what, or you can't express your binary dependencies in wheels right now. So is your recommendation to still use sdists for those kinds of packages or is there some other technique that can be done there? Yeah, for the moment, there's really no choice other than to use an sdist. I mean, I, I've always wondered, because uh, I haven't actually uh, seen a whole lot of those packages, uh, so I'd love to talk after this why you want to reach into a, 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 a C API built thing to actually tr grab its symbol table. <laughs> All right, thank you. That uh, concludes our question time. Um, so.